It's the pregame show. That's soon to be the actual show. Hi, everybody. Um, sorry for the late announcement today. That was my fault for getting stuck on a mountain. Um, and uh, I am pretty psyched that we pulled this show together. I think it's going to be great. Um, and I'm so glad, Nick, that you can join us. And Scott, it's always awesome to see you. Um, I'm kind of like loving like the Scott... Kate, Ben, like constant, like it's fun to have you here whenever you want to be. Like it's like it's. I feel mm -hmm. bad bringing you in into the, like the every day at five o'clock commitment that like we've all like the blood oath that Ben and I unwittingly took in like four hundred twenty-seven <laughs> episodes ago. <laughs> but like, but but you are always welcome to join the show oh, whenever so, you so, want. Thank you. I, I I love how you never make me feel like the third wheel that I am. Um, so, no, but you're not you. a third wheel. We just are, we're, we're like a wheelbarrow, Scott. You realize, <laughs> it's like, it's like, you realize like, we're, we're, we're live, you know, cause you set the auto uh, thing on. No, on, I didn't. No, I didn't. I, didn't. Uh, I think oh, we are live on Oh, YouTube. I did, whoops. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> and we're live. It's Friday, May 28th, <laughs> 9 2 p.m. Icelandic time. Uh, 5 o'clock p.m. New York City time. It is 4 o'clock p.m. Just outside Milwaukee on a train somewhere. And it is... Oh, 2 o'clock in Napa. Hold on. 2 o'clock p.m. <laughs> in um, in Berkeley, California. It Napa. So... I live in Napa. Well, oh, you're, it's so much you nicer. Live in Nap you're so... Oh, man, that's just like being like from New York City and like Scott correcting me and being like the West Village. Like, <laughs> that's just like... <laughs> no, Berkeley Napa is 40 Napa. miles away from Napa. Napa is... I well, it's a beautiful well, place, but there's nothing to do but from, eat like, and drink. The upper West Spanish Harlem <laughs> to the West Village, it's like 40 miles. Like, it like, could be, basically. <laughs> so, um, but, Nick, it is lovely. We are, and we're not allowed to have fun anymore, but we are allowed to have Nick Weaver here to talk to us about his theory of how ransomware is actually all about cryptocurrency, which... Scott also has thoughts about. Also, Scott, I see a cat lurking in your background. Do you think she'll make an appearance? Oh, it, she's actually. Um, can we all give her a little bit of privacy? She's. <laughs> she going to set her litter box? I'm yeah, sorry. she's. Can we? Can we? Can, can everybody please look away? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we, we, we're 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 really cla we're incredibly classy. So it, we keep the litter box in the middle of the living room, right? That's by the room. Yeah. We're That's so we it, it doesn't the show. To, you don't Nick. You don't come on a classier show than this one. <laughs> yeah. How does, so to see you. how does the uh, cyber law podcast compare in class to this? <laughs> Uh, less drinking and therefore a little bit less fun. Yeah. <laughs> sure. The ingredient for our lack of fun is alcohol. <laughs> well, I want to say I have um, this really nice bottle of 16-year-old uh, Aberlauer on this train. I do not have a glass to pour it into, so I'm just going to drink it like this. Oh my God! It's like, <laughs> I feel like the Vikings again, were again that. classy, were classy, just, yeah, classy, yeah, classy, yeah. So there's no open container law on this train. <laughs> Nick perfect. Weaver, I'm sorry. welcome back to the show. Thank you yeah. very much for having me. So, so get us started here. Get us started. We've got um, uh, uh, we've had a major ransomware scandal the last you know, shut down an oil pipeline and all that. Why should we be thinking of colonial pipeline in terms of... Of cryptocurrency. Oh, <laughs> yes. Well, Ben did instruct me to like toggle him off and mute him if like the, if things went awry like this. So I will assert my power, which is massive. And so why do I assert that the ransomware problem underneath it all is a cryptocurrency problem. 
We've actually had the notion of ransomware for a long time, but it's always been kind of a minor side gig. Um, hasn't been all that big. Back in 2013, however, it started to get big of it. Um, there was the FBI ransomware, there was CyberLocker, there was a couple others. These were targeting individuals um, and the problem was payments. So they would, the most successful would take either Green Dot, which is a prepaid service, I, or Bitcoin. We, I'm gonna make back up one second, Nick. You kind of rushed past a bunch of names and like, um, and uh, and events. Can you just roughly like give us an idea of what happened in those types of things and what happens in ransomware generally? I mean, I don't want to like dumb this down too much, but like, I just do think that it would okay. be useful for just a five second primer. Let's start with the concept of ransomware. I'm a bad guy. I want to make money because as a cyber criminal, you want to make money. That's why you're in the business. Um, Cause let me tell you living in Russia, otherwise not very fun. Um, so you're a Russian cyber criminal you've taken over somebody's computer. The question is, how can you turn this into money? Well, one significant possibility is you encrypt their data in such a way that they can't unencrypt it until you give them the key. You can steal their data and threaten to release it publicly or do threaten to disrupt their systems if they uh, don't uh, pay you. And this would, you, would you categorize like a denial of service attack under the last one? There or, has or not, been denial separate, of separate, service separate. extortion schemes. It's usually yeah, not called ransomware, but it's very closely related. Yes. Okay. Now, this has a long and glorious history. Um, some of the earliest ransomware was actually in the 90s, and you had to, like, send a check to Pakistan or something like that. Um, but there was a big wave around 2013, 2014. Um, and we had ransomware imitating the FBI. We had uh, the prototype of the current ransomware epidemic in that we had organized gangs where there would be splitting of responsibilities and affiliates. So one would develop the ransom software and handle the public relations. The other affiliates would handle getting it on to the victims. Um, and in terms of payment, these were fairly small potatoes people. They would, in the, in the few million dollars total category, they would accept either... Uh, various things, but in the end, what proved to be most successful for them is Green Dot, which is a prepaid credit card system, which at the time really didn't do a very good job about limiting criminal use. Um, so it was used for ransomware, it was used for a lot of scams, and uh, and the like. And it had legitimate uses for uh, basically money transfers between individuals. Um, and what happened is the bad guys at the time would, the most successful ones took either Bitcoin or Green Dot, but hardly anybody ever paid with Bitcoin because cryptocurrencies really are let's put it politely, a fucking pain in the ass to use. Yeah. Can, can, yep. can, I, I thought, what about e-gold? I thought e-gold was like the big thing that, uh, e -gold, uh, that cyber crime. Yeah, so e-gold and Liberty Reserve. E-gold was the 2000s, and then Liberty Reserve was the early 2010s. These were money transmitters that were overseas, basically under a business model of you move money into these things and then they they do it without capital control or without uh, money laundering control. And like there was ransomware that tried to use eagle too. Um, but the feds, uh, let's just say the folks behind eagle and the folks behind Liberty Reserve became long-term guests of the US federal government. Um, 
building money transmission systems, which deliberately uh, are designed to evade money laundering laws, gets you a nice stint for up to 20 years. Um, 20 years, free room and board, and uh, you got a job that pays you about 12 cents an hour. Yeah. I wouldn't take it, but... Um, okay, so 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 the difference is that it's not that you have these. It, what, what, what happens is is that you you have this evolution of payment systems. Mm -hmm. um, the earlier ones were kind of um, uh, taken out of business by by the feds, and then you have the rise of the of blockchain and these new kinds of cryptocurrency. First Bitcoin, and then others down the road. Uh, and so, it is it, is the, the idea that. The popularity of Bitcoin, or the popular the 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 developments in how easy it became to use Bitcoin. Except it affected. isn't. It's yeah. Bitcoin is it's really a pain to use. Have um, you seen these? Like, is, are, are you speaking? Do you, when you say a pain to use, you, you there have been some recent like articles about people who have like millions of dollars invested in Bitcoin and can no longer access it. Um, because they've forgotten their password or whatever else. I like put like three hundred dollars in Bitcoin, which is like many years ago, which is a lot of money now. But like, I have like paranoid attacks every couple of like months, like thinking I've forgotten my password and I'm never going to be able to access it again. <laughs> um, Sell it like, all. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really. I mean, yeah, so anyways, because there's we'll, no we'll intrinsic value, about... but that's another rant. Yes, I mean that's true. So, yes. So but, back to the history of ransomware. Yeah. So the thing is, is what Bitcoin offers is what's known as a censorship resistant payment system. That is, there's no central authority that's supposed to be thou, thou shalt not or thou can't not. Um, the only other such payment system is cash. And cash requires physical proximity and mass. Now, Bitcoin being a horrid pain to use really hurts if you want to try to do retail ransomware. That is, extort a few hundred dollars here and there because the burden for people to get up to speed is really hard. But if you want to extort $5 million, it's actually easier um, because somebody who's dealing with $5 million extortion, they're going to be able to hire an expert to help them walk through this. So this has given rise to what's known as big game ransomware in the past couple of years. And so the idea is an organized, affiliated cyber criminal organization breaks into one or more target networks, both encrypts the data so that the legitimate users can't access it, and exfiltrates the data before encryption so that the bad guys have a copy. And they basically go, give us five to $20 million or you'll never see your data again, except for this public release that's going to be horribly embarrassing and you're going to have to deal with all the breach notification laws. Um, and so what happens then is the, the victim calls their insurance company. And their insurance company basically says, if you can we restore from backups, charges. do it. But if not, this company over here, they're experts in negotiating the ransom. So you contact these guys. They will help you negotiate the ransom, lower the price. Um, they will handle all the hassle of doing the transmission. They will... Uh, claim that everything's under attorney-client privilege, so uh, the like. And Which, by uh, the way, it is probably not. Uh, yes. Uh, crime fraud exception, not actually attorneys, not actually legal advice, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Uh, if somebody who is yeah, not your yeah, lawyer uh, claims, that your, claims that your interactions with them are covered by the attorney-client privilege, uh, that is, uh, just be really skeptical of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, is it hip off? And so anyway, and then they pay off the ransom. And uh, these organized gangs are huge. So like 
the gang that hit Colonial Pipe is just one of many. You, there's, you practically need a scorecard to keep track of them all. Um, and uh, that gang alone has grossed $90 million in about less than six months of activity. We have other ransomware gangs that will actually construct targeted zero-day attacks. So you can't patch your way out of it and attack a whole bunch of people at once. So the CLOP ransomware gang is the one that hacked the Excelion file transfer appliances. So these are appliances that banks and businesses use to securely transfer files with audit logs and everything else. And so they broke into a whole bunch of these in December and January, stole all the data, and have been extorting the victims. And if okay. you don't pay up, they post it on a Tor hidden service. So I know so, because you see Dit got it. Okay, so I want to just pause for, for a couple of things. First of all, you're saying ransomware like software. Like this is a, a portmanteau of like ransoming something with software. I want to know a couple of things. One, this just sounds like fucking extortion to me. I don't understand it how it gets a special word for what it does. I don't think they're writing, they're maybe writing per like programs that specifically manipulate the software that they're like the proprietary software of like these individual companies, but they're not like creating something. So like, fine, it's just plain old extortion. Two, this is a story as old as literal dirt. Like this just sounds like dead wood Deadwood, South Dakota to me and like exactly what comes up when there is there is a lawless type of community and you have a massive amount of money and no one to stop these types of things that there is also kind of a number of entities that kind of grow off of a, a scheme of extortion because it is because, because it is effectively a new industry. Right. Yes. It is ex effectively like a very massive amount of money. And there are many people that want a piece of that massive amount of money. So it has plenty of of uh, of cushion to basically fund intermediaries um, in, a in like a million in the dollar a year industry minimum, right. if not right. more. The other thing you haven't mentioned, because we've been talking about a colonial mm -hmm. pipeline, but I think is the story of ransomware is that they target what we would call gray market industries typically industries like pornography you don't think so anymore no the okay. ransomware targets everybody so like while colonial pipeline was dealing with it the irish health service was down because they had a ransomware attacker uh uc the uc system we got nailed by a ransom system um scripts healthcare in san diego their it systems were down because of a ransomware attack no they these gangs go after real legit companies. They are not dealing with the gray mail. They are the gray companies. They are going for everybody. Okay. Okay, that was all my questions. Sorry, I didn't mean to like. I just kind of wanted. To, I just wanted to add that and see if you agreed with so, what I was how I was can, like categorizing. Go ahead, Scott. So, um, uh, one thing that's uh, kind of brilliant about ransomware is the fact that like up until the development of ransomware it, it it wasn't particularly easy for hackers to monetize your data um i mean there was like credit card numbers there might be bank router thing but basically you cared way more about your data than than hackers did. and they didn't have time to go through your stuff your inbox reading your your what's brilliant about ransomware is that they <laughs> they take the it's kind of they switch things around is that like that the ultimate uh, hostage is something that you care a lot about but the hotchest taker doesn't care anything about and that's the, the, your data yeah, no, fits, so, 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 fits that perfectly they're not monetizing your data they're monetizing your care about data you're, exactly yeah, Ex yeah, exactly you're, exactly. You're so, your attachment to the data right so what if it, so 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 in some sense it's it's actually a really i mean it's clever and also kind of shows the same thing about all security tools which is that the very thing that can keep us safe is the very thing that can harm us so like encryption is this amazing technology which enables us to securely communicate it's also the thing that can be used 
against us. So it's really, uh, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of um, uh, 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 brilliant. So, and it's extremely dangerous. So now, what would you, so what would you say to the people who say that we, that the government should um, uh, criminalize the use of Bitcoin in order to uh, prevent uh, these um, currency transfers amongst illicit um, uh, entities? Um, I would say you don't need to. There's a lot of policy tools already in place that can effectively disrupt that entire payment channel. And, can you mention some of them? Uh, yes. So, for example, um, Currently, the excuse why you can do these large transfers absent money laundering controls is that it's a decentralized system, so no individual is responsible. But that's a lie. That is a straight up lie. How the cryptocurrency systems work is to start with, you have mining pools. So you have like for Bitcoin, seven entities that effectively Every single Bitcoin transaction is formally approved and recorded by one of those seven entities, give or take. And, a the, few and those entities are, are, are the major mining groups yes. in China, mostly. Yes. Um, and as a consequence, these folks are all really money transmitters. The, there's a claim that being decentralized absolves you of responsibility, but the one that gets lucky and creates a block is the money transmitter for all the transactions in those blocks. Put bluntly, Bitcoin mining is technically grossly illegal already. You don't need to make Bitcoin mining illegal in the U.S. Um, Why is it illegal? So why is because, it illegal already? Because it's a it's money, money transmitter laundry. business. Yes. It's a money transfer business. Um, and it's a money services business. And FinCEN actually says whether you're a miner or not makes no impact on whether you're a money transmitter. It's ver the, the money transmitter laws are very much looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. And these guys are ducks. Yeah, I, I guess they would say that they're actually not transmitting money because Bitcoin isn't money because it's not legal tender. Uh, except that that isn't an issue because these are under FinCEN guidance are called convertible virtual currencies because there are ways to convert the Bitcoin to and from actual money. So oh, I see. So said, the fact that it can be related, since there's a kind of convertibility between it and legal tender, it, 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 it legal has tender. the same status. I see. Yes. So, but, so. But I'm confused. Sorry. Go ahead, Kate. No, no. Go ahead, Ben. So, but I'm confused by how this gives rise to policy levers, since uh, we're hmm. not going to treat these entities as, you know, unlicensed financial entities. They're not U.S. based anyway. Um, so, how does this Are give they? rise to? No, they're Chinese. You know, Chinese. Except that they, I think Nick agrees with me on this. Aren't one. quite. Yeah. So first of all, the mining pool operators are not necessarily where all the computers are. So the mining. The, the mining system, you, you have the central pool operator, which hands out basically work on this lottery ticket until you get lucky, hand it back to me, and I can package it up into the, the, the winning block. Um, and that, the, uh, that, it's the mining pool operator, not the mining computers. There are some mining computers in the U.S., and that is actually what makes it worse, because now these pool operators, if they just so much as allow U.S. participation, they're now under FinCEN. They have a tie to the U.S., and FinCEN has a long, long history of going after overseas people with vague ties to the U.S., um, I just DOJ did this in, in my jurisdiction does. class in internet law. I'm so happy to hear you like 
like re re like re re like saying this because I'm like this is my like this is okay so good. I my uh, question was just just yesterday a Swiss bank settled for seventy nine million dollars to the DOJ for money laundering thirty five million dollars in the FIFA scandal. Oh really? That was yesterday. Yes. So, no, but, I but, do not know that. But, but hang on a second. Um, if so, your argument is that there are these seven mining pools, and the U.S. should go after them all for money laundering, or they could just do know your customer on all the Bitcoin wallets. Uh, that Bitcoin by design is only Swiss numbered accounts. Yeah, yeah you're going to have to work at it, but you could theoretically make a mining pool that is fully compliant with U.S. money laundering laws. You just have to do it. And the thing is, the miners, when they select, they aren't a passive. Or the mining pool is not a passive decider of which transactions to validate. So there's so many transactions that can be validated the amount of space in the block is considerably less. So the mining pool is already making active decisions as to which transactions will actually be validated by that mining pool. So, so, so let's just say, th this is like super duper in the weeds about like how you would actually um, uh, enforce these money laundering rules. But is it, it is it, your position um, that the only way we're going to get control over ransomware is by uh, regulating cryptocurrency? Quite probably. And I'd like to add that the reason why I believe this is to be the case is because of the success we had against the Viagra spammers a decade ago and the nature of the banking system. So Let's start with the second. I want to transfer five million bucks to a uh, a overseas entity that's a bad guy for ransom purposes. If I use um, cash, I'm going to actually have to get that fifty kilogram lump to the other guy, and that's that's a, that's going to be a no show. If I want to use the banking system, the banking system react, would treat knowingly being used by ransomware providers as an existential threat. So back in the uh, days of the Viagra spammers, the spammers used had to process credit cards. And uh, what we developed, uh, I was just one small cog in a very big team is methods where we do one test purchase. Well, Damon McCoy would do one test purchase, find out the bank account of the uh, Viagra spammer. Pfizer would send a nasty note to that bank and the bank would close the account immediately um, because the risk to the bank of being cut off was an order of magnitude more than the revenue they were getting. And so this is actually, so go ahead. Fin I'm sorry, finish what you're saying, Nick. I didn't mean to cut you off. I thought you were- And we still see it. this today. So like just yesterday, a major Swiss bank settled for 75 or $79 million with the Department of Justice for knowingly laundering 35 million. And of that knowing 35 million, they got a fraction of a fraction of that. And so- being known for the bank for ransomware is going to either get you squished by the DOJ or cut off from the banking system altogether. And in either case, that's an existential risk to the banks. And so the banks will not tolerate this. And yeah. so the only game in town is cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency sucks for payments. It's actually provably inferior for any payment that can be done through legal channels. Yeah. And it will always be that way. But it's the only game in town, and so that's what the bad guys have to use. I think that there All was, right. that, like, if there is a will, there's a way, and if there's a lot of money, there's a way. But Deirdre, 
Um, we just brought you in. Um, sorry, Ben, did you want to say something? No, I uh, I wanted to introduce Deirdre, uh, who yeah, go ahead. worked for something called the Zcash Foundation. <laughs> so um, which, which, which part of, of Nick's diatribe do you want to take issue with? Um, some little uh, quibbles about you should go after the miners or the pools of miners. That's where you can really like, eh, maybe. That's just one lever. That There's is a one lot lever. of others. Yeah. Uh, requires first... Coinbase to do physical delivery would. <laughs> mm -hmm. If they don't want to be a bucket shop, do physical delivery. Maybe. Either do physical uh... delivery or fill out those 1099s as a stock exchange and do all the uh, stuff there. Uh-huh. Um, the number one thing that comes to mind is exchanges like Coinbase, but other custodial solutions where, you know, you could be a ransomware company and you can collect all this Bitcoin or whatever coin it is and you can stick it in a wallet, but eventually you either want to mix it into, well, mixers are, mm, I think they're cryptographically fooey, but that's not here, here nor there. You want to get it out into fiat currency at some point. You have to go through an exchange if you want to spend that money in the real world. If you don't care about spending that money in the real world and you want to buy a Lambo and someone takes Bitcoin, that's nice. But exchanges, I think, are much more, exchanges and custodial solutions are much more amenable to regulation, especially ones that are based in the United States. Um, I have to give a shout out to Gemini. Um, Gemini is an exchange that supports a uh, shielded withdrawal of, of Zcash, which I work on. Money laundering as a first class primitive in your cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. um, and I was going to say something else. Exchanges tend to be highly compliant for basically all the reasons that Nick was talking about and, and about FinCEN and stuff like that. Uh, they need your ID. They will ask for your passport. They will ask for your firstborn child to try to stay compliant because when you take your cryptocurrency and turn it into US dollars or euros or whatever it is, that that is really where the rubber beats the road. So, so I would Deirdre, continue how, to lean on those. So how are those, I, I, I'm curious how uh, the, you know, if you're doing $90 million of Bitcoin ransomware in six months, um, how are they getting it out of Bitcoin? Presumably, presumably they're not, you know, uh, buying their tickets to the French Riviera in, in Bitcoin. Like what, what's the major mechanism for getting stuff out? I don't know. I think a lot of them are holding on to it. And I think well, one of the reasons is that Bitcoin has, you know, the market just crashed in the past two weeks. But it's still up like 100%, 200% over the past two years or whatever. I wouldn't call Bitcoin like the gold, the like stable uh, currency of cryptocurrency, because when you drop 35% in two weeks, I don't consider that stable. But compared to other ones, like if you put value in there, it'll stay around for a while. And if you can put it through a mixer, and try and literally launder it through a bunch of other cryptocurrencies and then withdraw it somewhere, you might have enough plausible deniability to actually put it through an exchange. And, and there's turn a lot the of uh, laundering because uh, most of the cryptocurrency exchanges are actually cut off from the banking system and are basically using uh, substitute dollars from a company that. Uh, I've called the second coming of Liberty Reserve and thought the DOJ should have squished three years ago. Is this Tether? Tether, and now Circle's doing the same game. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean the, 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 what, what I don't really understand about Bitcoin in general is that it's supposed to be two things, which is that it's supposed to be anonymous and it's supposed to have no oh. inter intermediaries. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. no, but that's the a, point. It's not it's anonymous. It's not anonymous, it's anonymous and, and, it, and it, it highly, needs intermediaries. It is uh, highly unclear if it was ever intended to actually be anonymous. I think the, the primary goal of the designers of Bitcoin were decentralization and no control of any one authority. And now we have minor pools, as Nick was describing, but there's no 
Fed, there's no bank that is in charge of the thing. The, the, there's that no the censor of everything. Exactly. There's no censor that that sh that said says thou shalt not. And this is yeah. why, in fact, I consider the greatest risk from cryptocurrencies is that they're successful, <laughs> because cryptocurrencies committed a crime against me. It's made somebody with non-trivial, squishy, Silicon Valley libertarian feelings believe in the harsh fist of money laundering laws. <laughs> um, is, you, you are, <laughs> in this sense, a total fucking mystery to me, Nick. I will be honest. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's because I've been watching this space professionally for almost a decade now. So most people in the cryptocurrency space have to be believers. Because what happened believers is you look in. the believers in the underlying concepts, believers in the uh, underlying objectives, believers in making money from a decentralized uh, self-organizing Ponzi scheme. Um, so for the most part, most people who look at that either are believers because that's how they get paid or they go, it's madness and walk away. <laughs> it's just, I had discovered a business model as an academic starting in 2013 with a couple, few colleagues. Um, we mine the comedy gold, turn it into papers, get publications out of it, and that's our monetization model. So I've been following this space for, since really 2012, 2013. I'm sorry, and is it? Is it is Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, yeah, or, go ahead, Nick. I'm sorry. I, go ahead, uh, Scott. I just want to ask what Zcash. I, I, I always wanted to ask what Zcash was. I, I was cool. really so Zcash right. is really cool yes. from a technical what, standpoint. Zcash is yeah. trying to do what Bitcoin, what everyone think Bitcoin actually is, which is trying as much as possible to be as private and deniable as cash, cash, physical cash, digitally. It happens to be on top of the decentralized consensus, blah, 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 that Bitcoin has. It uses uh, a cryptographic technique called zero knowledge proofs to check all the rules about Alice sends Bob five Zcash or whatever. Um, and I can prove that I have not spent this note before. I have not, I am not double spending and I am not inventing money out of thin air. It's able to check all of those rules without revealing anything else about you or the recipient or the money you're sending or some metadata. We have like a little memo field you can add other than the rules are correct. Like all of that is private and encrypted on the blockchain. Mm. So all of these pieces of data are encrypted and visible on the blockchain, but no one can make any sense of them unless you control the key or, or so, your recipient controls the key. For example, if you want to pay a ransom in Zcash, <laughs> you pay it <laughs> in Zcash and now you can't even pretend to do the blockchain tracing on where did the money go and try to even theoretically limit the problem. This is what I mean by Zcash makes money laundering a first class primitive and just as uh, much as physical cash. Uh, yeah, that, she's got gotcha, you. She's got gotcha you there. She's got gotcha you no, there. Say. No, yeah. physical cash requires proximity and requires mass. And you keep those saying mass. Are, Can you explain what you mean by mass? You mean <laughs> it's like the actual you, physical you, corporeal you, cash? cash takes up, You're constrained by the fact that you have to cash carry a million dollars in cash. Paper. So if you want to <laughs> carry a five million dollar ransom, or a five write, million dollar ransom weighs. 50 kilograms. Okay. Unless, I, I mean, I understand the mass are, idea. I just wanted you to like explain, like you kind of like were throwing it around. Like it was like, everyone should understand what you're talking about. No, so but that's the limit. Kind of break that, down, like. that cash has two things that limit the criminal use. It's big and heavy. And the gateways. I know this because I have a number of bars of bullion in my life, <laughs> in, my, in my possession. <laughs> And the gateways to get that into the banking system are actually pretty tightly regulated. There's a reason why money launderers yeah. who do the cash to electronic 
get a pretty good premium for it. Um, that's a yeah. This is uh, so so so. Nick's point here is absolutely right. Um, it is not simply an issue with money laundering. It's also an issue with money storage. Um, if you do very large cash business uh, and you have no access to the paying system, where you put it actually is a problem. And, um, and you know, money rots. Um, you can't bury it for long periods of time. And so there are all kinds of creative storage uh, solutions in the criminal underworld for how to deal with that. And it's, it's a serious problem. So Deirdre, what, what do you, if you're, uh, what do you guys do to prevent cash from being used as, as a money letter answer? We currently don't do anything at the protocol level. So the cryptography and the, how you agree upon consensus and how you exchange value and all of that in the protocol, it's dumb. It's as dumb as it's as dumb as Signal. It's as dumb as uh, the encryption in your web browser. That sort of thing. The I don't think there have been any proposals about anything at either end about there's it since it's a cryptocurrency. It does not have the same moderation regulation points and levers as such like a platform such as whatsapp or whatever um it is anyone who can run the software can send money can send value and everyone who is checking all of those rules on the blockchain and zero knowledge establish that they're checking it um it is quite dumb in that way and i think that that is by design um, so you can't yeah. Yeah. So I want to ask a question because that goes back to something Nick said earlier, which was like, sell my Bitcoin, get get out of this thing. And I, I want to just talk about this for a second, because like I this is a since I was a kid, this has been something that has bothered me, which is the idea of money and currency as like as as making sense and credit as making sense. And kind of Ada on Wednesday night, Ben talked about this, about like kind of like the value of a coin for its weight in metal versus the value of a coin for what it's backed by like some type of security interest and like the credit that is due to that. And then also just like the credit of a person and the credit that like any type of individual can have. And so like, it is not clear to me that Bitcoin can't continue. Like as like some, like, like all, all that is required of any currency, frankly, is that people believe in its value. It is all smoke and mirrors. Like all of Wall Street is smoke and mirrors. Like there is like, and this was like, I, I mean, if anything taught me, this was the 2008 kind of housing like debacle. Like people had been like building houses on smoke and mirrors for, for like, 10 years. Um, and so like, I just don't understand, like, why is it that Bitcoin is necessarily going to fail? That does not seem self evident to me. Yes, there is nothing actually backing it. It's not real. But like a dollar is a piece of paper, or as good as the Federal Reserve will make good on it. And if the Federal Reserve blows up, in like some giant like you know or like the like the entire united states implodes then we're not going to like it's just going to be a piece of paper again and so like i i just like i just kind of want like i mean so so anyway sorry that's my point deirdre i really would love to hear your thoughts on that um yes uh i think you had charlie warzel on here recently and i think they wrote something that was basically oh. like it's all meme stocks all the way down like all the stuff with GameStop and AMC and Dogecoin yeah. and, and all of that, where the value of GameStop stock had nothing to do with the value of the business. It was just gamified because people realized that they were short sellers in a short position. They decided to go YOLO, let's have fun with GameStop stock. And then they shot it up and someone made money and then it crashed again and all that. And you can make an argument that that is exactly the same minus the short selling position that people had for dogecoin like nothing happened to dogecoin to make it go from like micro fractions of a penny to 75 cents us cents 
uh, per Dogecoin. And then a bunch of people became millionaires and some of them didn't sell. And I don't know why, because they were holding it anyway. There's nothing to say that the value of the US dollar now that it is not backed by anything but the faith and credit of the United States and the Fed and, and so on um, isn't similarly tenuously tethered from the value of the US dollar and like what is backing it. Like, I don't think it's going to happen, but there's nothing to say it can't happen as well, which is basically like people having fun and memifying stores of value and the value of the asset or the token or the, the currency being completely dis disconnected and disjointed from the thing that it supposedly reflects the underlying value of, aka whatever it is, is just what we believe it to be and not even believe it to be, but just think it should be for fun. <laughs> I yeah. beg to differ. And okay. here's please, please. The, this is something I've been thinking about for a while now. And what it really comes down to is zero sum versus positive sum versus deeply negative sum. So a zero sum transaction for every dollar earned, there's a dollar lost. Stocks are not zero sum on a long-term basis. If you buy a stock, and hold it for a while, you have dividends, you have share buybacks, you have new money going in. Stocks are positive sum on a long-term horizon. But you Zero. might not live for a long-term horizon, yeah. so why does that matter? Um, like, it, like what, 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 like your horizon is like a, like a defined value. It's not a, like a long-term horizon. Um, manias and bubbles are in some ways slightly divorced from whether it's positive sum, zero sum, or negative sum. But the important distinction I make is that an investment needs to be positive sum on a long-term horizon. That a zero sum is not an investment. Zero sum is paramutual gambling. The horse races are zero sum. You don't hear about people going to treat the horse races like they do Wall Street. Wall Street, however, has made a big uh, deal about trying to convince people that some that these zero sum activities, these gambling activities are investments. And the cryptocurrency space is just LARPing that on crystal meth. Um, <laughs> and this is why, in fact, I say to avoid Bitcoin and sell it now. And the reason why is if you hold on to a stock, on a long-term basis, the value does have the part that goes up. There is a net expectation value from the dividends. Better yet, index funds. Um, index funds are are kind of the optimal. Yeah, um, I was going to say that. It's like if your theory holds, it's not actually a stock market. It's an index fund of the stock market. Yes. But Nick, I, but Nick, I want to push you on this because. You and I had a conversation on the Lawfare podcast when Bitcoin was worth, you know, a mere $250. And your attitude at the time was uh, sell it, get rid of it. The market stays irrational longer than I can value. stay solvent. Um, that's, this is a irrational market phenomenon. The difference is, however, at Bitcoin, and the reason why I'm saying sell it if you have it, is because Bitcoin is not zero sum. Bitcoin is deeply negative sum because of the cost of mining. That yeah. that Norway worth of electricity that Bitcoin consumes per year is paid for by all those who hold Bitcoin and the dilution of the perceived value. Um, and so unlike normal currency or normal assets, Bitcoin is costing a obscene fortune to maintain. Additionally, that's not an externality. Let's the just tax. think about this. Okay. But, but, but now I'm saying as a Bitcoin investor, which I am not, 
I believe in the ransomware market. This is, uh, I have confidence that ransomware needs a, 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 needs a, a, a currency people are using. So it has value. True. That would be a utility value that's inherently above zero. So I would argue for the ransomware people, you could switch to another coin that is far lower in its life cycle than Bitcoin just to move money around if you really wanted yeah, to. Yeah. May I suggest Zcash? It has money laundering as a first class <laughs> primitive. <laughs> Nick, be nice. <laughs> I like, I like Sarah's he's, saying, he's saying first class primitive. I know. Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it, it's it really is good at that. It's, it's really well designed. It's far better than that Monero hack. It well, might. Oh, thank, thank you. Yes, the cryptography is, I, in my opinion, better and stronger than Monero. Uh, money laundering as a first class primitive, notwithstanding. <laughs> Do you want to? Hey, uh, but can I? Can I just suggest that, like, we turn the show into a pump and dump show? <laughs> uh, I. If, if we just want to log into, we want me to log, try to log into my Bitcoin right now. No, we can, like, no, I can just convert I it to Zcash a live. No, I got a better idea. I'll give idea. you all my password. That's no, not. I got a better idea. I'm going I don't even create, want my spouse's passwords. I'm going to create a hundred trillion Dunning Kruger and tokens. <laughs> hundred trillion DK tokens now exist. Kate. Would you I, like I'm to buy one of insult, these, by the way, Nick? <laughs> one of these DK tokens for a dollar. Please do so. Now I hand you a DK token. You hand me a dollar. It's a zero sum transaction, and now we have a market cap of a hundred trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> this is why the market cap figure is completely meaningless. Yeah, they can go away and. Um, a week, as we just saw. Yeah. Um, Deirdre, I am, and, and Nick, I'm curious just to kind of ask you guys, like, since we're talking about ransomware and everything else today, do you agree that it's a, do you agree that it's kind of a meet, like, it's a term that is just meant to, like, to talk about, like, it's a, it's a new term to describe an old thing of exploitation, and that it's like, or, I mean, do you think that it has like a value add in in terms of how regulators deal with this problem? Um, I think ransomware, as opposed to start, insert different kind of malware here, uh, is useful at least in indicating that they're tr they're ostensibly encrypting your data and holding it hostage and asking for a ransom, as opposed to. I don't know. Some of them encrypt it. Some of them exfiltrate it and, and say, like, we have it over here. If you want to get back, you know, pay the ransom or whatever. And we promise that we haven't exfiltrated anything more as opposed to generic malware or generic. Um, we have your data and we pro if you pay us a hundred thousand dollars in iTunes gift cards or whatever, um, we promise that we will give it back or delete it. The, the encrypting it either in place or, you know, some version of that is much more of a, like, we have it and we promise we'll give it back if you pay us. Um, someone, someone was said something about hostage. Do they ever do that? The thing. They do do that. However. But if they give it back, does it really matter? Like, how do you know that they're not going to like oh. ever like it's, I mean, this is the problem of all extortion. So there's two things. One is, do you care about the leaking of your data? Say you're Sony, like they got infiltrated by North Korea and they, they leaked all their emails and it was very embarrassing and they did not like that. But the other component is operations. If you're a hospital, if you're the city of Maryland, if you're whatever, it's not just leaking of data that you're worried about. It's can you function? And if you're a hospital and you're, all of your systems are locked up and you can't process patients and you can't administer doses of medicine correctly, you don't care as much about the leak. You care about being able to operate your systems because if you don't, people may die. 
And yeah. so if you have the promise dangled in front of you of everything's fine, just pay us and we'll unlock everything. It is very, very tempting to pay that ransom. The way you mitigate that is you have good backups. You have good patch systems so you don't get infiltrated in the first place. Unfortunately, if you're a hospital, like there's a cost benefit analysis of, oh man, our systems are running on an operating system that hasn't been patched in 10 years um, versus like buy a new piece of equipment that'll like directly impact a patient's life. And so you run behind and you become more vulnerable and you may not have backups and so on and so on and so on. So there's I, I, want, I don't like the victim blaming because part of the okay, problem. Hold with on, the hold on one second, days. Nick. Hold on one second. Deirdre, I just want to say I'm gonna like I'm gonna X you away because crowd caskets janky with five plus people on. Um, but Deirdre, thank you for coming in and lending your voice and telling us like and like kind of Tell and me also, how I'm please, wrong. Yeah, and also Deirdre, if you I'm going to make a plea. Please come on and be a guest yourself someday. Sure. We would love to have you on um, and to talk about Zcash and like your thoughts about cryptocurrencies. So before you so away, I wanted to you. reply to Nick one way. Yes, yep. Zcash is different than cash because there's the speed and uh, availability of large amounts of money that is not equivalent to cash. You're correct about that. The downside of any cryptocurrency, including Zcash, is that if you drop your security key in the river, all of your money's gone. So there's pluses and minuses to having your digital money be completely digital. One is the speed and amounts that you can do. And this is a commonality of many digital platforms, interconnected systems that we have today, including WhatsApp, Signal, Facebook, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but you also have downsides. That's it. <laughs> Deirdre, thank you. That was amazing. Um, Nick. Please respond like whether however you and I'm sorry that we didn't get to any questions, but we no had worries. such we had Deirdre come in and so that was just like a lot. It was great, but it was so Nick, go ahead, please. Um I think with Deidre, it comes down to we have a fundamental disagreement about the utility of anonymous transactions. Um there are cases that I've come to the conclusion where the benefits of anonymity are dwarfed by the damage done. So Tor Hidden Services is another example. We talked about it the last time I was on here. Um, yep. the, the payment channel for cryptocurrency is the other one, um, or payment channel for ransomware is the other one. But the, the back to why I think that uh, we take out cryptocurrency, we take out ransomware is there really is no alternative that um, the, Somal the, the citations of people saying, oh, but what about the Somali pirates? Those were an order of magnitude less money. And they had to take serious efforts to go through and, um, and uh, transmit the money. And they were not attacking US uh, flagged ships. Um, that uh, you you attack a U.S. flag ship and just the Navy SEALs come and kill you, forget this whole ransom business. Um, of course, there are no U.S. flag ships operating over there because uh, everybody goes under flags of convenience. Details, details. Yeah, um, yeah, right, they're all Liberian, right? Or something yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what was it? Hold on. What are you holding? What are you holding, Nick? A uh, beanie baby. I feel like you got this. Is it a beanie baby? Yes, it's a beanie baby. So this was some. This is happening in the chat. People were like saying that Bitcoin was beanie babies. Is that what you think it yeah. is? That's a yeah. lot of mass. Um, it's a very <laughs> similar <laughs> phenomenon. And up until this recent uh, explosion in price, it actually wasn't any more significant than the beanie baby market. It's only this recent explosion um, driven by basically a couple of overseas frauds um, that's driven the price up. Um, and yeah. truth be told, I actually have some hope. And what my hope is, is that the frauds will just blow up because before anything else goes out of the way. Because one of the things is on the cryptocurrencies is they're dependent on high price to have any security. So if you drop the price of Bitcoin to a thousand bucks, 
you can undo the ransom payments. Yeah, I mean, I have to say that I think that this is a moment, I, I disagree with you in a bunch of ways, one of which is that the US government is going to be able, is going to be able to do anything to particularly control this like kind of ransomware. And the other is that like, I think that like, this is a moment like speech, which is like most of what I like work on and talk about that. Like you can't create answers to these things through a public system of governments necessarily. You have to have some type of public private cooperation and it has to be kind of across borders and that it's not like you just can't talk about it in terms of like one like they just like the internet doesn't like acknowledge countries and so i think that like so too like all of these various cryptocurrencies and like the power of ransomware um i think that eventually we're going to have some type of norm balancing happen in which like people decide that they have that this is a big enough threat and i think the colonial pipeline might start pushing us there um but like like generally nick i like not to not to like rain on your parade but like i gotta say like i think the regulators have no fucking clue what they're talking about when it like the people in government have no idea what they're talking about when it comes to any of this stuff and even the people that they're talking to like are like are like marginally equipped and i just think that there's not there's not a lot of hope in like the immediate future for this being something that regulators tackle. Do you think that I'm wrong? I think that you're wrong for the following reason. The internet may not respect borders, but the banks sure as hell do. Money transmission and uh, money transfer has long been under significant government control because whenever it's gotten out of government control, we've had things like 9-11. Um, a lot of the laws that are used to enforce money anti-money laundering was actually in the Patriot Act as a response to the Walla networks that were, or Hawala networks that were being used by the terrorists to move value back and forth. Um, and the DOJ really cracked down on those in the early 2000s as a direct consequence. And I don't see governments tolerating the cryptocurrency space once they realize there are levers, that it isn't this decentralized thing, but you actually do have very limited central authorities in all these systems, they're just not claiming to be. No, um, I, yeah, we're going to leave it there, I guess. That mm -hmm. was Nick. I'm thank you for joining us in such short notice. Thank you for I'll, having me. So I always love talking to you. You mm -hmm. are like, yeah, it was great. <laughs> also your whole, room by the way it looks so cozy and sweet yeah. oh <laughs> a little like all you have so I, many i love that I, like you have bookshelves full of adorable toys and not books so that's great i, I just want I, I just want to say first of all it, God, this, this is real oh wait just a sec did, did i just wait did i am i still here now all right yeah you're here me? now but you're just since you're <gasps> oh, a nice puppet. room the puppet oh, wants puppet. to say hi <laughs> I would. Hi, I missed my puffins. I'll have to get them next time I'm there. But that is very cute. I love that. I, it tastes like pork. Go ahead, Scott. I, well, I would just say that, like, it's so no, interesting to me because I, 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 I listen. I listen. Uh, I listen to you all the time on the Cyber Law podcast, and you're you're always um, uh, the kind of the one who fights for privacy and uh, and uh, um, and uh, takes I would think the kind of um, more libertarian take um, and you you were you were pretty pro you were taking the Stuart Baker line we got to oh, get <laughs> gotta get the that's government that's to. why I say that Bitcoin committed a crime against me personally it's made me believe in the authoritarian <laughs> that's right, that's right. Okay. fist of money laundering laws. Um, I see. Okay, I yeah. see. I he see. really hates. But, he really hates the mental inconsistency that this has created for him. I understand that yeah. feeling. 
<laughs> um, the only thing that's fortunate is Bitcoin will never work for real world payments. So, uh, and that was clear back in 2013. Right, right, well, right, right. I, okay, well, we have to go, but I was just going to say that, like, um, you've seen, of course, Nick, and if anyone wants to, like, read a great story about um, about Bitcoin being used for day-to-day -day payments, my friend Cash Hill, who's been on the show before, did a wonderful story about um, trying to live on Bitcoin for a week and, like, almost starved to death, lost 10 pounds, and, like, and so that is... Um, yeah, do you? I don't know if you remember. Yes, that, I yeah. remember that. Um, the other thing is, is if you ever need an antidote to the space for uh, serious, technical, but readable, um, my ACM risks of cryptocurrencies from a few years back is really designed to walk through what are the individual technical risks, the individual economic mm. risks, the societal risks from this entire space. Fantastic. I, um, I, I, I've read, I, yeah, I've read, I, I, I've read your work before. It's really clear. And you can drop a link to that in the chat, Nick, if you want. Uh, to. Yes. Let great. me go grab um, a link. Let's see. Yeah. And while you do that, I'll close the show. It, we are, um, it, we will be back 22 hours and 53 minutes from now. I will not be there for just a Saturday because I will be on a plane. And um, unless the Wi-Fi is good enough for me to dial in, which it never is, let's be honest. Uh, like, so it probably won't try. Um, it, uh, it will be uh, just Ben and Scott tomorrow um, on just a Saturday. And uh, I don't think Ben's gonna be on a train anymore. I think he's gonna have been arrived. So uh, we will do that and I will do it 22 hours and 53 minutes from now. Thank you for um, putting all of the links in the chat. And thank you, Nick. It was great to see you again. Thank um, you we're not allowed me. to have fun anymore. But in lieu of fun, Scott. We can have money laundering as a first class primitive. As a first class primitive. <laughs> I, yes, exactly. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>